with the work that I was doing in the community, I started to realize that I was networking. I was doing community engagement. I was doing program planning. I was doing health promotion. I was doing um, stakeholder management, partnership and relationships. These are different skills that public health professionals today, I would say the ones that some of them that I've come across are lacking that I was already doing as a college student. So then when um, I came to a program planning class and or the senior SEM class, and I was in front of a professor, a woman of color, who was putting us in, you know, who had these different um, um, projects for us to do. And I was like, oh yeah, this is how you do this. And it's just like, wait, she knows what she's talking about. So it's just like, I was already doing that and I did not know there was a name for it. And then, so there's the advocacy part that came into play. The social injustice that we were discuss we were identifying in the community, not just in the Haitian community, but in the state of New Jersey, in our county, in, the, in our within our municipality. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 39. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Hope you're doing well. Hope you enjoyed your three-day weekend. If you had a three-day weekend, hope you had a good Valentine's Day or Single Awareness Day. And I hope you're taking time to just unbuckle and get ready for the remainder of the year. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation today. Definitely talking about plug plugs and like connections and just really making sure that you are connected into whatever you're trying to do or you find those people to help you get to those places and make those connections. So huge networking today. And I know you guys are going to take a lot of value from this story. I know I did myself and reach out to this person if you have any questions. They are definitely a plug. So let, let them know and they would, they would be more than, than uh, willing to help you. If you have not as yet, definitely subscribe to this, review it, share it with a friend. I appreciate you all. Um, Without further ado, here's today's episode. Today, we have an energetic, certified health education specialist with seven years of experience in health and human services, navigating the health tech world. She has a bachelor's degree in health education with a concentration in public health from Montclair University. She has worked as a youth service worker, health communication and promotion intern for Union County, New Jersey, before getting a master's degree in communication and information studies at Rutgers University with a focus in health communication. She then went back to work for the Union County, New, New Jersey in various roles before recently switching into a current role as community engagement manager for a startup tech company called NowPow. Additionally, she's a So Me ambassador for the Society for Public Health Education and the New Jersey ambassador for the Public Ladies and Public Health Chair. Um, additionally, she was recently accepted into Howard University for a PhD in Culture, Communications, and Media Studies. So big congratulations. And uh, check her out on Instagram at Munchy the Plug. We have Marlene D. Emmond, M-A-C-H-S, aka Munchy the Plug. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? I'm Thank doing you well. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Like, I, I know we've connected on Instagram and then we connected in Clubhouse for a bit, which is kind of cool. And now <laughs> we're going to connect on video here. So I'm just excited to tell, tell your story and everything. So how are you doing and how you've been coping? I'm doing great. As far as coping, um, music is one of them. Self-care. Everyone knows I'm the self-care queen, you know, taking walks, getting fresh air, having quiet time yoga working out so i that's how i've been coping you know keeping in touch with people um facetime zoom mm -hmm. <laughs> so when i feel zoomed out it's just the facetime or you know when i can you know meet with friends and family safely yeah and what what, what got you into uh, self-care being the self-care queen so as far as being the self-care queen um, time management, managing my time, setting healthy boundaries. I used to feel like I was all over the place. And um, part of taking authority of myself was just simply making sure that um, I say as many no's as I said yeses. And um, part of that was like making sure that I had time for myself. And as I started that walk, a lot more people noticed a change and would reach out to me and say, hey, like, what are some self-care practices? 
um, one thing that I love to do is I love to read as well. Um, that's one thing I did not mention. And, you know, I would set different types of schedules for myself to do different things that I love and explore different activities that that always intrigue me. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And I appreciate that, uh, that, that perspective. Um, so how do you identify and then tell us a little bit about your personal background? So I always tell people that I am a proud Haitian American born and raised here in Jersey, but my parents migrated here from Haiti in the eighties. My pronouns are she, her, sis, emphasis <laughs> on the sis <laughs> and um it's to the point where i put it in my work email signatures and um a, a lot of people have noticed and said wow like i need to in i need to include that in my email signature as well so yes yeah, she her sis um queen as well um just a little bit about my personality i'm very bubbly very um outgoing very friendly uh anyone who will tell you say that you and me will tell you um, that Marlene is just a ball of fire. So um, that would be a little bit more about my personal background and my personality. Okay, okay. And um, actually, where, where did you get the, the nickname uh, Munchie, Munchie the Plug? So for the first part, Munchie, um, I got because I'm five foot two and I'm very <laughs> petite, but I can eat. I am an avid <laughs> snacker. I just looked away because I have like a, a tower of just snacks in the corner. And... <laughs> So, and then like, you know, it's great because working from home, you know, you never know when you just need a snack. So I keep them close. Um, <laughs> secondly, the plug came to about when, um, when I was in college, they both came about when I was in college, you know, I was constantly connecting people. I was active in the Haitian Student Association and I was always coming out with different ideas, different things to do. Um, I'm on campus, different ways to engage the students. And then this was a time when Twitter first came out. So we're talking about like 09, 2010. And um, I go right into social media and connecting with other people and realize like, wait, we can connect with other people outside of, you know, just the in-person um, way. So I would constantly find different resources and just um, educate myself about different things. And over time, I would plug people into different DJs, different hosts, different um, musicians, different venues, different um, people who had different services. And then now, um, I, as I'm being a lot more intentional about my work, I'm plugging in students, young professionals and professionals to other black women in the field. So, um, and it's one of those things where because of social media, I'm allow, I like it allows me to plug in and tap in, plug in and engage with more people. Yeah, okay, that's awesome. I did not know that, so I'm glad that uh, we got that down low on you here today. Um, and that, th yeah, thank you for sharing that. So, so how, what does that mean for you? Like to, to be the plug? Cause I feel like there's so much value in connecting people and it's something, it's a skill that a lot of people don't try to cultivate, but it, it I think it, it, it's very valuable. Well, be, as far as being a plug, I, I'm an advocate for networking and I tell people all the time um, that networking will open doors that your degree won't. And that's something that I always push, you know, young professionals and or students, um, public health students, because it's a skill that they need to have. So um, it's one of those things where I tell people all the time, do not be afraid to ask for help. Being a plug requires you to learn how to ask for help and or um, allow people to be vulnerable to ask for help and connect them with the right tools, the right strategies, the right people and in organizations and places um, to tap into. Okay. Yeah, awesome. I appreciate that. So now getting in, I guess, to the public health part of the interview and telling more about your story, what does uh, public health mean to you? Public health mean to me? If you asked me this when I was a student, I would give you the textbook word of what public health means to you, what public health meant to me. Um, but for me, now public health and what I'm doing right now, the word that comes to mind is community. Public health is a community of people who are looking to advance and advance health, advance um, technology around health. People who are looking to use those two components to make sure that they're prolonging our life and um, prolonging our life, addressing, ad addressing health disparities, health equity, um, people who are trying to prevent diseases. So 
Um, I think that's what public health needs to be. <laughs> yeah, and and that it, that it so much because it's just like there's a there's a social justice com like most in the past year or so there's this there's this racism component to it there's this social justice that component that, that comes into it and it's one it became one of the reasons why I decided to apply to Howard University because like I mentioned public health what if you would ask me what public health meant to me when I was in college. It, I would give you the textbook. Whereas now it's like, no, it, it means it means advocating for others, right? And when I mean others, black, brown, indigenous people and people of color, it's not just about, oh, well, let's make, um, let's do these programs and let's, let's walk away. No, how are we going to provide a service to the community and make sure, make sure that we are earning their trust, that we are eliminating the distrust, the mistrust, right? And that we are giving them the tools that they need to um, address their health concerns long term and making sure that there's people that look like us in these spaces, right? And that's very important. So, what public health means to me is advocacy, it's community, it's engagement. Yeah, thank thank you for for putting all that together. That's definitely awesome, and we we definitely need more public health at the forefront. Just focusing on like what we have seen in in the past year, and and I guess well. If, if, if you look at it like the systemic racism and all those things that have been happening and public health is, is positioned to really make changes and advance health and well-being in all these different spaces. So um, thanks for sharing that. So getting into your schooling career now, you have your bachelor's of health education with a concentration in public health. Did you go into college uh, with, with that major and what was your thought pro process going into college? When I went into college, um... I was, I, I I was actually in sports. When I was in high school, um, I ran track and field, and I knew that I, I I knew that I wanted to study something around health, but I also wanted to keep the sports component. So I studied sports medicine. But as I started to engage more in my community, um, in the Haitian community, I noticed that like okay, I I love health, but I love the community aspect. I love putting together programs. I love planning planning programs, um, program planning, health promotion. And um, my senior year at Montclair, I decided to change my major. I, I didn't know how I was gonna tell my mother, but I found a way to tell her. And it was a five-year program. The, um, so I was, I, I was a fourth, fourth year student at Montclair when I changed my major. And I was like, mom, my program is you know five years. And she's like, what? If you change your program, you're gonna have to do this. I was like, no, I, I can transfer all my credits over to health education. They did not have public health as an accredited program. That's why it was my concentration. When I was getting ready to graduate, um, it, it was in a process of becoming accredited. So I said, oh, okay, I wanna have, I, I wanna be part of this accreditation. And they said, well, you have to stay an extra semester. I said, goodbye. <laughs> I said, goodbye. <laughs> so I, you know, um, the beauty of it all was that that senior year, I took senior seminar and I took program planning with um, with my now mentor, um, Dr. Thorpe, who was a woman of color, who sat the entire class down and said, do you guys know about chess? Do you know this, do you know? And everyone was like, oh, but you know, it wasn't an accredited program. So, it, so everyone took those courses to then, they took the public health courses to then navigate to their other um, areas of expertise, whether it was epi, whether it's nursing. But I was one of the few who um, wanted to pursue my career in in um, as a certified health education specialist. So she made the entire she would give you know the entire class um, basically a run through of what Ches was. Um, she too was um, is certified health education specialist. So um, during my undergraduate career, making that shift and again the networking aspect, right? Because my then professor is now my colleague in the field. I kept in touch with her um, through those classes. And through those classes, she, explo she exposed me to a number of things within the field. And, um, and some of the things that she was in exposing me to, I was already doing in doing within the community. And I didn't know there was a name for it. So it was like, oh, I want to continue doing this. I want to stay in this field. OK, I have to stay here. This is where I belong. But I still have to fine tune what is it I want to do long term. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and it definitely is is something that I hear a lot, just people going into school is like sports science, exercise science, biology, and then they find something that, that is public health or more public health related. And they're like, oh, this is a fit for me. So what, what kind of That's stuff? Hard. 
Yeah, yeah. What what kind of stuff did you do um before that that you said, oh, I was doing public health work, I just didn't have a word for it? So I became a member of my organization called Haitian Flag Day Planning Committee of New Jersey, right? I was just a member then. Um, I'm the chair of the organization today. And um, when I was a member, they were doing different different types of work in the community. And because I had a health background, um, I was able to contribute in their efforts. And some of the efforts that they were um, working on, um, sickle cell anemia. So we did like a blood drive. Um, we were raising awareness on what sickle cell anemia um, was, how did it affect the Caribbean um, culture, the Black diaspora. We during that time, that's when the Affordable Care Act came came about. We took um, our knowledge. We would um, research about the Affordable Care. We pulled different parts of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, that um, that the Haitian community needed to know. And what we did was that we would go to different um, churches in the community and host seminars. Right, whether it was after church or before the Sunday. Um, the, the evening services, we would present a um, we would present the information to them. And then what we would later find out, we would just later discover that a lot of people were asking questions for a friend. Mm -hmm. And we were like, hey, what is this for a friend? And what we realized is that a lot of people were speaking for others who were undocumented. So then again, a spark, we would start one thing and then it would trickle to the next, to the next topic, to the next. So it went from um, whether we were addressing sickle cell to like, okay, People didn't have insurance, so affordable. Let's educate them about affordable af affordable care. We would educate them about affordable care. Identify there was an there was a um, immigration issue. Then we did an immigration form, and then we would and that would trickle over into one thing. So you know, leading up to now, where um, last year there was a concern um, of engaging the Haitian community in the census, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end, you know, just that, that continue that 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 steady educating advocating and raising awareness within the community where we would build the trust. So that with the work that I was doing in the community, I started to realize that I was networking. I was doing community engagement. I was doing program planning. I was doing health promotion. I was doing um, stakeholder management, partnership and relationships. These are different skills that public health professionals today, I would say the ones that some of them that I've come across are lacking that I was already doing as a college student. So then when um, I came to a program planning class and or the senior SEM class, and I was in front of a professor, a woman of color, who was putting us in, you know, who had these different um, um, projects for us to do. And I was like, oh yeah, this is how you do this. And it's just like, wait, she knows what she's talking about. So it's just like, I was already doing that and I did not know there was a name for it. And then, so there's the advocacy part that came into play. The social injustice that we were discuss we were identifying in the community, not just in the Haitian community, but in the state of New Jersey, in our county, in the, in our within our municipality. Yeah, that that is uh, truly amazing, and there are a lot of key points in there for any student, any person who wants to do public health. Like you don't necessarily have to get that public health experience while you're going to school. There are so many different ways to get that public health experience and get into the community. And then one thing that I really liked about what you said is that like you'd go into the community and do one thing and then from that one thing and educating and learning you you see where the actual community need is at that point in time and then you meet them there again and then there's something else that comes up through more education and more communications with the people and i think that that's the way that public health has to be it has to be on the ground floor talking to the community that's seeing what the their ground. needs are and cultural competency um cultural sensitivity um being mindful of the fact that you know um, that people are afraid of certain types of authority in the community, keeping in mind that people are trying to protect not just themselves, but their families, um, making sure that when you're building trust, you are transparent and you're holding yourself accountable for any mistakes that you're making, right? So it's these are things that um, I see that other public health professionals that are not of color may not necessarily think about right away. But being that I'm Haitian and English is not my first language, you know, I made sure that during that time I would hold my, my leaders accountable by saying, allow me to speak Creole. And when I speak Creole, if I say something incorrect, correct me. So when I would be, when I would speak in front of my, uh, my community and I would, you know, I would 
try and make that effort. Other people may, may moan and grunt, but others will say, no, she's speaking. Correct her, encourage her. So then there, there's that trust. You know, I was transparent about that, my lack of, you know, um, the lack of, of um, not, not the culture, but as far as like, you know, my, my choreo wasn't the best, but then to help me improve, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I gave them something to do that was meaningful to them, which was engaging with someone who looked like them, who spoke like them and understood the culture. So then at the same time, I would also hold them accountable to teaching me different cultural things. And part of them, part of them doing that, they didn't know what I was doing is that I was understanding what the taboos were, the stereotypes were, so that I can then say, okay, well, what are these taboos and how can we break the taboo by providing that level of edu that, that education, right? If there was, um, you know, low literacy in the community, how can we make sure that we have images that we have, um, we're not using too much text or we're giving them a visual to help them understand what, um, what we're trying to, um, to share with them. Yeah, and, and that is a, a key point once again. And I, I think it's just so important to to like as you shared, you you learned in the process with them. It's not like you went there just to teach them. You went there to to learn just the same way they went to learn. And through that, there was a, a bonding and 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 I think that that is what we have to work towards to do. And as as you said, like a lot of um white people um like I was reading an article today that my organization helped write and they were talking about the uh, grassroots organizations and how they were just the the TE technical assistance that they got was just they didn't they didn't understand the culture the value and they were just trying to bring this like white professional professionalism dominant culture there and it just didn't work and and that's one thing that I'm working on is just really understanding how to go about building capacity in this grassroots organization so thank you for sharing that so <clears throat> getting into what you did in, in your in your under in your undergrad you were a youth service worker for the city of Elizabeth. Um, so how, how did you come across that position and what did you do in it? In that position, I actually started out as a, um, as a student within mm -hmm. their enrichment program. And, you know, after, you know, I aged out of the program, I would volunteer. And then from volunteering, I went away, you know, when I went away to college, um, you know, and I can't, I would still come back and volunteer. So due to that volunteering that I was doing, I then was offered a position there. And um, during my time there, I also interned at the Uni County Division of Youth Services, where I later um, landed a full-time um, full job with them um, and stayed there for a couple of years before navigating to my current position here at NowPal as their community engagement manager. Okay, okay that's awesome. So the, the position that you had afterwards as a health communication and promotions intern, was that at the same organization? As a youth service worker, I worked for the city and as an intern, I was on the county level. So when I interned, um, I, you know, when you're interning, you learn the ins and outs of the organization, how things are conducted. Um, I did a, a number of, you know, um, I was able to shadow one of the employees there, the, um, one of the, I would say they were a social worker, but one of the main focuses were um, assisting with putting um, e not events programs together. Um, I would contribute ideas. I would develop um, marketing materials. And a lot of it um, included, you know, I wouldn't say reading, but a lot of shadowing. Um, and of course, a uh, number of, you know, clerical <laughs> work, but the work was, was more so like I would read things but then say like, okay, as a public health professional, how would I do this differently? And I would always tell students that now, when you're when you're in these internships, how would you do things differently? You know, because we 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 come in with this textbook style of way of thinking, but I tell people that there's going to be a moment where you're gonna to need to throw the textbook away because life is gonna show you something differently. So yeah, that that's key information there. Because as as you as you know, as a public health professional, I feel like you have to be in the community to to know the community and and just do that work. So uh, that is uh, hugely important. And then your last role, um, while while you were in your undergrad, was an assistant store manager for the vitamin shop. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because I was actually like in between trying to like wait for that next role type of okay. thing. But I mean, my role there actually contributed to my current lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because when I was at the vitamin shop, I learned more about herbs 
in alternative um, medicine. I learned a lot more about um, health than I ever thought I would. Um, I learned about different um, supplements, different herbs, different remedies. I learned about um, veganism. I learned about vegetarianism. I learned, you know, a lot from the magazines that would just come into store, right? So they would have these magazines that would come in and my other colleagues, they were just like, oh, I'm not gonna read it. But then like, I would take the time to read the magazines and I would, I would take, you know, take a highlighter and highlight different things. So in the midst of highlighting different things, as customers were coming in, you know, over time, they would say, Marlene, you're making a lot of sales. You know, how are you doing? I'm like, I read the magazines. It's like, what? I'm like, yeah. So it's just like, I was a certified health education specialist and I knew that I could, you know, use leverage that to, um, to share and educate people about, you know, health. But also I would circle back and use the magazine as a source. Like, hey, you know, by the way, you know, they were free magazines, but the customers didn't know that. Hey, thank you for shopping. Hey, I'm going to throw you in a free magazine. And like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> but then in actual, it was just like, you know, giving them knowledge. So for me, plugging them in, just sharing that knowledge, sharing them that, that resource so that, you know, they would go back. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll, already flagged the pages in advance so they say hey just turn right to it and then i'll give them the one my copy and then we'll go back and get a new magazine and flag what i needed to flag so it helped me with sales it helped me with um relationship building again is we're circling back in these skills right it helped me with sales relationship building networking um sharing my expertise in the field to the point where customers um would come in you know the the, the frequent the frequent customers will come in and they'll say, Hey, Marlene, Hey, I, you know, I love that product that you shared, you know, um, I brought my daughter in and let me, you know, I would like to look at this or that. And, and it became a thing where people came in looking for me. Okay. And, and that was awesome. And I, and I feel like there's just value in there because you could have went into that position and been, been like your cool workers and be like, ah, oh, it's whatever, but you took time to learn and actually actively engage with, with the work. And from that, you gain so many other skills. And like, I feel like sales is a skill that a lot of public health people don't have. So oh, that, yes. yeah, so that's definitely that, a, a beneficial one. It was great because, you know, I still go there now and, um, I don't know if you noticed, but like there are times where I'm posting something and people, oh my God, where did you get that? And I'm always tagging them like, hey, this is where I get this. So and that's another way that I'm plugging people in. I'm making sure that anything that I, I'm sharing in my stories on IG story or whether it's Twitter, I'm making sure I'm tagging the source so that people know, oh, okay, this is where I can go. So people look forward to that when I'm um, on my social media platforms is to plug them in. Yeah, that's awesome. So definitely go and uh, follow her. So be sure to follow her. Um, so you, you, you alluded to you, you became a certified health education specialist. Was this primarily just because you had this mentor, this teacher that, that had this uh, same credential and was like, this would be something great for you to do? Or what, what was the thought process for getting that? That was one of them. And two, I did my own research. I looked up um, the CHES certification online and um, NCHEC, um, that's the organization. So I, I researched um, Chess. So what I discovered about Chess was that, you know, a Chess, a, Ch a certified health education specialist can work anywhere, whether it was government, within public schools, in, um, in a hospital, in healthcare. But then, you know, I later, you know, found out that Chess certif certified individuals can also work in tech, like myself, right? So, um, so I got certified in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then um, late last year, I decided that I would take my MCHES, my master certified health education specialist and um, exam. I did not pass the first time and I am currently sitting in on the next exam in April. Okay, okay, that's awesome. And you will definitely uh, persevere and you will get to where you wanna get. You're gonna become MCHES certified very soon. So that's awesome. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. How how has your chess helped you throughout your career, just broadly speaking? Oh, a lot. A lot. It's to the point where I advocate for chess and I um there are times where on LinkedIn um people have reached out to me and said, Hey, I noticed that you're chess. 
are you consulting right now? I'd like to, you know, it's, it has become a thing where it's um, creating opportunities for me. A lot more people, a lot more companies, a lot more employers and employees are understanding the value of having someone that's CHES certified, especially when it comes to grant writing opportunities, um, when it comes to um, um, seeking third party um, consulting, as I mentioned before. So if you have someone in house, then it allows them to, you know, whether they're saving money or they're making sure that they have that person with um, with that area of expertise. So I'm seeing more and more people of color are, apply, are um, applying to become CHESS certified. And for those who are on the fence about it or they don't know about CHESS, I always take that opportunity to share more information about CHESS, advocate for CHESS and share my, my experience with CHESS. So um, like, like I mentioned, a lot of people are, you know, contacting me on the side or they see they see the um the credential if there's something that's foreign to them they ask and then later on they would circle back and say hey i have this opportunity do you or anyone else do you know is available to provide some type of consultation or um can can do this type of work for me okay and yeah that's awesome and i and i know um people i think as people which has they also need them for like curriculum development and that kind of stuff for development Mm -hmm. um community um community needs assessments especially um program planning budgeting administering um evaluating uh promoting health health these are all different things that um ches certified individuals can do right mm -hmm. so um my like like i mentioned my area of expertise is the advocacy and promotion part um as well as the health communication part so I, you know, I tell people that's my expertise, but I tell, I, I like to share that brochure with them and even lay out the competencies for them where mm -hmm. they can see like, wow, I thought you just, you know, were in high schools and become, you know, you're a health educator in schools, but you know, there's this distinct difference between the two, you know, with chess certified individuals and health educators who have to, um, you know, get their K through 12 teacher certification, but it's, you know, there's, um, it can be a slippery slope there because um, teachers are not required to have a CHES certification to teach health education. But then we would have to have a um, teacher certificate to teach within the school. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that, that is a interesting uh, problem there. What what is your uh, study process like? What, what was your study process like for the Ches, and what what is it like looking like for the M Ches? So I have a master spreadsheet, like a study guide that I use. I use PowerPoint, so Google PowerPoint. I use um, this app called Quizlet. I pay for their annual um, subscription, and it allows it gives me access to all of their flashcards or study notes, things of that nature. Um, you can actually add a class to your quiz notes. I'm one who like, um, I like the spiral note, note cards, flip cards. Mm -hmm. I have I have one for like every area of, of um, responsibility. And um, what I do is that I like to study early in the morning. For mm -hmm. me, I'm an early riser. So I found that during my graduate studies that I would focus better between the hours of 4 and 6 a.m. So what I would do is I'd wake up early, um, study between those hours, take a nap, and then um, get up an hour later, get ready for work or work and or um, just start starting my day. So that's that's a way that I study, but also um, I would meet up with, you know, different friends virtually who were um, studying the uh the chess and or the m chess and we would just throw scenarios at each other so that's a great way to learn is learning through others okay yeah that's awesome thank you for sharing that advice there and then after after this you uh you went on to get your master's degree in communication and information studies at rutgers university so what was the thought process for for getting this my thought process was i need time a lot of people, they, they quickly jump into, you know, hey, I just finished my bachelor's. I need to do my master's. I gave myself time. I gave myself time because I knew that I needed experience. I took some time to work, um, but I also knew that I needed time to be intentional about what exactly I wanted to do, what I exactly I wanted to study. I knew health communication was the 
the, um, the focus, but I did not, Rutgers was not my first choice. I was looking at other programs in Georgia, North Carolina, because those other programs, they were within a public health program or, or a school of public health. The health communication track is not um, in a school of public health at Rutgers. It's at the SKY program. So the School of Communication and Information Studies. So when I um, got accepted and I um, started the program, I noticed that I was getting a lot more strategic organization skill. I was gaining a lot more strategic organization skills and knowledge, leadership in healthcare. Um, uh, I took a health comm course, but a lot of a lot of the um, courses I was taking further expand um, the different skills that I was looking to achieve and circling back and incorporating it into public health. Yeah, that, that is definitely awesome. And I'm, I, I'm glad that you found your, your path to, to get in there and you also took your time. I think some people do rush to, to get into like the masters or just that other thing without really thinking through what they have to do. Yeah, were you gonna say something? I definitely like- Oh you. no, I said that um, I, I took two years. Two years, I thought it through. Um, after I got my my um, master's, I took three years. I got my master's in 2018, and now I'm getting ready to start Howard in 2021. So I, you know, being intentional, making sure my vision is clear. Um, and in between those, in between those gaps, I was I remained engaged in the community. I um I kept in touch with certain professors. I made sure that I was expanding my network and making sure that um. As a plug, right? I wasn't just plugging other people in, but who in my circle can plug me in? And that's one thing that I want people to understand. As you are building these networks and these connections, identify who can um, identify individuals who can help you during your times of vulnerability, who can share resources with you, who can connect you with that advisor at that university, and who who can connect you with that that individual at that place of employment, even if it's just for a um, an interview, you know? So that's that's important. Yeah, huge, hugely, hugely important. Um, th did you have a concentration for your master's degree? Healthcom. Healthcom. So, so what they, so it was a school of communication and then they had three tracks, mm -hmm. media studies, uh, journalism, they had digital, they had digital media, I believe, and then it was healthcom. Okay. And so now Rutgers has um, definitely expanded their healthcom program. So sometimes I'm like, crap, I wish I. <laughs> so it's just like, oh, look. But it makes me happy because as that program is growing, um, it's, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you went to Rutgers. I thought, I'm, I'm familiar with that program. So it's just like after I leave a university, I'm getting a lot more feedback. It's the same thing when, you know, I went to Montclair, you know, now, now when I say that I'm an alum, people are like, oh my gosh, I know that program. I know this professor. I know that. Do you know that? So, you know, just like, oh, wow. You know, just sees how, you know, when you step away, the value of that, that program continues to increase and then people are resonating with it. Yeah. And, and especially when you're doing um, good work in the community or good, good work for public health and in general, the, the uh, schools love to promote their, their alumni, their students that are, are doing great work. And it definitely does um, give other people who are looking to the school a, a think, oh, this person did it, this person came to this program and it's a good program. This is what they're doing now. So uh, that's, uh, that's some great insights. Uh, were there any big takeaways that from, from your master's program that you wanted to share? I knew that later in my um, program that I knew that I was gonna get my PhD. It was just something, it was just like, it, you know, I thought I was, I was done and I told myself, you know, yes, I, yes, I'm getting my master's, but there's something here. Is there something more? Mm -hmm. I, and that, that was a, that was a take, like as I, and I think during that time I was reading a lot more about public health but not just public health, but public health from a different lens as a woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, I had just picked up Medical Apartheid and a lot of people were, were telling me, hey, take your time reading that book. And it, you know, and and as I would, you know, slowly read the book as as suggested, it was like, okay, wait, there's there's something here. There, there's there's something here that I'm missing, but there's also there's a calling that's taking place here. So that the takeaway was more so of an aha moment. Okay, okay. 
and that, that's awesome to, to think about and and just like what you were saying earlier that you you knew that there's this is aha moment but you also took your time to say okay i'm gonna wait three years to really ground it find my vision do everything that i need to do to really know that this is the correct path and i'm i'm gonna be happy and 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 fulfilled going down this path so that, that's truly uh good perspectives and i think people should just like your mindset is is, is a great is a great thing to, to take into perspective and, and as you said the the intentionality i think it's uh so important it's so important yeah. Three years wasn't intentional. It it happened that way, you mm-hmm. know. Um, you know, as I was, you know, in the community, as I was looking at different things online and thinking, like, why would you promote something like this to that community? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, or I would see certain materials, and I'm like, that word is triggering to that community. You know, who's on your team? Like, <laughs> who's in your organization that's straight? You know, that's revising this so that so you know i started to see that and the importance of health communication when it comes to the black diaspora right yeah absolutely so um after your master's degree you uh went on to to become a public health communication administrator for union county new jersey so um tell us about the process of getting this job so while i got i got this position while i was there actually um I remember I was a I was an intern for them. I left. I came back as a consultant, um, where I can you know I facilitated a number of workshops for them. Um, I I was do, doing a number of workshops for them, and then um, I was working on another contract with them. And as I was working on that contract, I started incorporating what I knew from Ches. I started incorporating what I knew in health communication. I started incorporating all of these all of these um, skills and knowledge that I was, I was learning while at Rutgers. Um, I took a um, inter-organizational and stakeholder management course that blew me away. So as I was, as I was incorporating all of this into my work, I was getting a lot of outcomes. And then it was the outcomes that they were looking for, right? So as that took place, then I, I was offered a position there full time. And then that full time position, when I graduated, they um they they offered this new title right they wanted to make sure that everything that i was learning and that, that i was applying to um to my to my job matched with with my title so then um it was a it was a simple title change and then um a change in responsibilities so what i did was that um with this new title and this new role I was now overseeing all communications, um, you know, whether it was um, social media, uh, identifying different referrals. How do we engage the community? Um, I would do outreach within 21 municipalities within the county, right? So that grassroots effect. There were there, you know, I wasn't glued to my desk. You know, when I was at when I was at my desk, I was doing admin work. But then after that, I was in the community, you know, making sure that you know this city knew about. Um, about upcoming work that we were um, upcoming programs, and then of course when you know when there were um, different calls or referrals that were being made into the into into our um, into our office, you know I would use that as an opportunity. Like, okay, this is this is the data that we we have. Okay, maybe we should start promoting this program in this city, or maybe we should do this use this program and host it in this new city, right? Um, rather than this city, right? So it, there's that strategic organization that was coming into play. And then making sure that we were um, collaborating with an organization in that city, right? To bring in clients. So by collaborating with those organizations, it was a strategy, a great strategy because when we collaborated with the organizations, their, their clients knew that if they participated in these said um, workshops, they had, um, they received incentives from that organization. So using these things, right? These are different skills that um, I, circling back again, strategic organization, organizational communication, right? Stakeholder management, into organizational <laughs> relationships. And these were a lot of things that um, I was just bringing to the table and using what I knew in public health to um, eliminate the disparities and address the needs that, um, that we had in the office and or within our community in terms of engagement and outreach. Okay, that, that's awesome. And that's definitely some awesome work to do uh, right out of college as, as well, right after your master's program. So then after your public health communication administrator role, 
you uh, moved on into your current role as a community engagement manager at Now Pow. Um, and on, on, on LinkedIn, when I was doing like research to, to write you this question, they said that LinkedIn helped you get this job. So how, how exactly did LinkedIn help you get this job, first of all? That's a wonderful question. And I love that they have that option because um, I, I was trying to maximize my use of, of LinkedIn. So what I did was that I paid for a premium premium um, subscription mm -hmm. to LinkedIn. And I made sure that I tailored my profile for recruiters to know that I was looking for work. And, um, you know, after being blown by the data and the analytics, um, I made sure that I used certain keywords to, um, to apply for certain jobs. And as I was searching, you know, LinkedIn has this feature where they'll tell you they'll match your They'll match your uh, LinkedIn profile with certain companies and or positions, and they'll let you know, hey, you're in the top 10%, you're in the top 25, or you're in the top 50, right? And um, they will identify the different skills that you have and maybe skills that you want to add to be a lot more marketable for that position. I never imagined going to tech, um, but this community engagement manager position came about, and I said, wow, okay. I definitely do all of this. I, I do health disparities. I do advocacy. I do this and that. So the first interview with NAPA was a phone interview and it was not your typical phone interview. We chat, we talked about public health. We, you know, and it was to the point where the interviewer had to stop and say, okay, you know, you clearly know what you're talking about. So let me just ask you, you know, the other questions that I have, you know, she, 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 she basically said, I'm looking at my, you answered majority of these questions. You know, let's, let's schedule another, let's schedule another interview, like on that call. And, um, and it was great. I, it, I felt like um, they understood me. I feel like they understood public health. And um, unlike other employers, they, they would go through third party organizations or, mm -hmm. you know, employer, third party, third HR. party. To, yeah, they would go to third party HRs to, um, to interview people, but then they did not know anything about public health where it was to the point where I would have to repeat things to them or say, hey, I answered this in, in the second or third question. And, and then you can, uh, you can see and feel like the engagement wasn't there that they knew anything. They were just checking off a checklist for that, for that, um, for that employer, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yes, once I, um, I had, I had maybe four interviews with them. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're in, a, we're in the time of COVID. My final interview was a Zoom. Inter I had two Zoom interviews, and one of the Zoom interviews, I sat with maybe six people, um, which included my direct supervisor and my direct, uh, my the head of my department, right? And um, I I had to be creative. I used um, a software called Canva to use uh, to create a presentation and create a portfolio because, like, we're virtual. I had to be creative. So um, once I landed that job and um, when LinkedIn asked me, did I have an interview? I, you know, I checked off yes. And then of course, LinkedIn would circle back. Um, when you update your job, they will ask you, did LinkedIn help you get this job? And I made sure I clicked yes. Okay. <laughs> but I, I love that. I didn't even know that was a feature, but you know, um, and that's something great to, to have because then it shows, um, it shows other uh, companies, other employers that, hey, look, look, you, you know, um, our platform is successful when it comes to um, pairing, you know, professionals up with their dream company or whatever um, their next their next place of employment. Yeah. Okay. And so, considering that Nowpow is a health tech company, did you have any interest in going into health tech before you came across this role, or, or like, well, no? I didn't. I love technology, but um, I was more cons I was looking for more of a communication or advocacy type of position with, or even you know, um, whether it was like public health advisor or. Mm -hmm. um, but when I came across when I came across, um, and it was in the first time I heard about NowPal. That's another thing I heard about them twice prior, mm -hmm. and then it, I remember, I remember those two aha moments prior to the interview I'm um, prior to applying and then said wait I remember this platform and this platform was so cool 
Like, I wish we had this platform at my last place of employment. I remember that's what I was thinking. I said, okay, let me just, you know, let me just complete this. Um, and the first interview I, I said was the phone interview. But prior to that, I had a, um, I had a serve, not a survey, but like, you know, a paper, mm-hmm. like a questionnaire to complete. Yeah. So that was actually the first thing that I did. It was a questionnaire. Then there was a phone interview. Okay. But awesome. yeah. Awesome. And right. I didn't imagine going into tech and the transition the, the transition was interesting because mm-hmm. so, then it was just like I was a public health person in this in this place and it was just like going into like the Willy Wonka chocolate factory everyone <laughs> had their own thing and it was just like hey what you know hey how are you and it was just you know it was very different it was very casual very um very informal whereas you know I came from a, a government background where it's just like very you know um bureaucratic Bureaucratic, yeah yes yeah. Okay. And what, what, what was that transition? Like how, how did you adapt to that, that change in, in scenery? Um, I had a lot of, Oh my God, <laughs> you can do that. You can do this. <laughs> because it's just like, um, one thing that I learned in a, um, com- organizational communication, um, course at Rutgers was that, you know, there's different types of, um, work groups, right? Mm-hmm. There's that we are, bureaucratic work group where you know you have to um you can't just contact just anyone you have to go through a hierarchy right Mm -hmm. whereas here at now pal it's like oh my gosh you got to lead great you know and one of the um one of the now pal values that i love is that we rally when we we rally when we we celebrate and we rally when we lose right so um, I, I just butchered that, but um, it, it, it focused more about, it was more relationship based, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it um, you know, in these places, in these different spaces, it was, it's okay to share that you don't know and that you need help, you know, because in it circled, uh, circling back to what I said about asking for help, it, vulnerability is, is embraced. So she said, oh, hey, so just let me let me plug you in. Let me connect you here. Let me connect you there. And and innovation is embraced, you know, and government it may take a while for things to happen. And because I'm a change agent, I like to, you know, be engaged. I like to do things. I like to be, you know, I like to work on the next thing or I like to know, okay, following up with this person, following up with that person. Whereas now I, I'm able to do that. I'm able to, um, it's not that I wasn't able to do that before, but the pace is a lot uh, is a lot quicker as far as change taking place, initiatives being um, being accepted, and or um, launching. You know. Yeah, and, and that's some great insights for people who might be interested in to go into like government jobs compared to like health tech or other like more. I would say. I don't even know, more uh, modern type type of jobs, I, I guess. Um, I would say, I don't know, that's really bad waiting there. So what do you do in your role as a community, uh, community engagement manager? So my role as a community engagement manager is that I am the plug for now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously, I made being the plug my nine to five, right? Mm. And how I made that my nine to five is that they, they told me, we hired you because you're connected you know how to, you know, you know how to speak to people. And it, um, it was very to the point, you know, they were direct about why they hired me. Um, and it showed afterwards, you know, um, I've been with now pal, um, for maybe five months, I'm going on six months and, um, just the different strategies that I, that I implemented, um, just, you know, innovative strategies that, that would, cha- they, they love to, to be challenged. So I create community-based organization networks for our anchor account customers. Um, and that includes um, speaking to different organizations, their executive directors, putting, getting them onto our tool so that our anchor customers can send, share, track, and share, so that they can share, track, and coordinate <laughs> referrals mm-hmm. with them. So what that looks like is that um, basically when someone shares, send a referral, and there's been times where, you know, um, in the past, where you don't know if that person really received that referral. So this tool allows uh, healthcare systems, CBOs, and other agencies share those share those referrals, track the referrals, and coordinate those referrals. So within their within their network. So I basically look for other um, community based organizations to partner with them, or if they provide me with a list of community based organizations, I get them onto the net onto the tool and connect it to their network. 
Okay, okay. So it's kind of like a CRM tool in some sort of way, if, if that makes any sense to you. CRM is community <laughs> referral management. Something like that. It might be customer, but customer. There you go. It's to an extent, yes. Okay. Okay. That's that's awesome. And like uh, broadly speaking, what does now power do? Is it like is it broadly just online? Is it an app that people use to, to to do it, or is it that is it this just one thing? This or is it multiple things? So now power is an evidence based referral tool, right? Okay. They're based out of Chicago, and um, it's you. It, it's an application to software, but you can use it on a web browser. You're going to add it right onto your, your bookmark. And um, the great thing about it is that um, it has an in-depth service directory mm -hmm. so that organizations can identify the different organ organizations and or the anchor customer can identify other organizations that they can um, share um, referrals to. So if they have a client that comes in and they need health and human services, social services, they can identify those um, services they can send the uh, the referral to that participant by phone. So they'll get something called a health ERX, right? Mm -hmm. A health ERX right on their phone. And then, you know, rather than getting a piece of paper and then potentially losing it. So that health ERX can be translated into different, different um, to different languages. And that's one of my favorite parts of it because it allows people of color and or people of other, um, backgrounds who speak different languages can click that link call call the organization on that in that link get the service that they need and if that organization is tracking that referral they can know when that referral was sent to that partner and that partner can they don't know when that partner accepted the referral when that when that patient came in mm -hmm. when that participant um completed that milestone right? Whether it was a nutrition education, whether they received um, food for the food pantry and more. So especially right now with in the time of COVID, um, now power is definitely gaining a lot of speed, especially within um, communities, um, states like New Jersey and New York, where there was a higher COVID um, crisis and rate compared to other states. Yeah. Okay. That, that, ma that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think like if you're a student and you're listening to this, you might you might be thinking, oh, that should be something that is is a regular thing. There's referral systems, but it's it's not a thing. Um, I know, and and it's it's fascinating. <laughs> like we're we're in 2020, 2021, and and it's like only now, it's only now starting to, to like hugely become a thing. I, I know, like when I was in Alaska, we were working on this uh, Connect Matsu, which is a information and referral hub similar to it's like what you're talking about and there are just so many challenges that that they were coming up against um but these kinds of things are so important to to get that accurate data and get people these services that they need in a timely manner at like and meet them where they're at you know like communicate with the language and and all those different things and so so i think that's really awesome and i think we need more of these kind of like disruptive health health uh, organizations to Upstream. be able to, yeah Upstream efforts and what I like to, what I all, what I always tell people is it's about access, right? Mm -hmm. In a lot of these communities, they don't know that there are, there are organizations that can help them. Mm -hmm. So imagine you walking into one office that's using a NowPow tool, and then they're referring you to other organizations that you didn't even know about, right? Mm -hmm. So now that organization that's using the NowPow tool is eliminating that disparity of access to healthcare, right? Because now because there is a uh, part of our team, they go into, they, you know, they're, they're working around the clock to identify your big organizations down to your small organizations that help specific um, cultural communities to make sure that they're on, they're on the tool so that as more um, potential customers are getting onto the platform to use so that they can share, track, and coordinate the, the, um, their referrals they can then show like a, it's just like a web, you know? Mm -hmm. So now power is like powering through knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So that they're powering communities. So that's their, that's their tagline, powering communities. And, and it's just, I'm happy to be a part of it as a community engagement manager. But for anyone that's listening, I want them to also understand you don't have to be technical to work for a tech company. I, you know, I have the little technical skills that I have, but being in this space uh, has exposed me to so much um, data analytics, how, you know, 
product marketing is. And I'm learning through different people in my company about what health tech looks like and um and how it's addressing the COVID-19, you know, pandemic. Yeah, and, and I think it's so po- important that you that you mentioned, like it's a it's a network. And as more people get linked into the network, the network becomes more efficient and becomes better at connecting people. So that that is like that is a, a key, a key, key thing. So uh, thank you for I'm working from now, pal. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, well, absolutely. Just, again, it goes back to what I said about being intentional, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So in, in your role, I would assume that you do like a lot of uh, community engagement as, as your role title says. So how, how has that been challenging coming into this role during COVID? So I'm an in-person person, so it's definitely challenging. But what, I, um, what I've learned is that um, I had to identify how do I maintain engagement, right? Um, everyone is on Zoom, but how do I identify and how do I identify and locate uh, coalitions that are using Zoom, right? What are different coalitions, public health coalitions, or whether it's a substance abuse coalition, or whether it's a COVID-19 coalition, right? Because these coalitions, within the coalitions, when they were having their meetings, they are attended by community-based organizations, right? Mm-hmm. So my target audience is the community-based organization. So what I, one of the strat- a strategy that I'm using is identifying these coalitions, introducing myself, introducing what NAPAL is. And um, what I've been finding is that organizations within these coalitions are saying, oh my God, I heard about you guys. Hey, let's connect. And, or when someone, you know, when I see, when I gauge that level of interest or if I gauge that level of curiosity, you know, I make sure that I thank them at the end of the at the end of the meeting. I, you know, send them an email and a follow up. So I'm engaging by um, being present in their meetings, um, touching base with them, and then you know, do a chat and chew. And I, you know, um, instead of calling, oh, let's do a Zoom meeting. No, using a word like chat and chew. Hey, let's just let's let's just chat. It makes it a lot more informal and comfortable for that person. And you know, a few of them have even said, you know, can I steal the word chat and chew? And I'm like, absolutely, take it. Because again, we are in the middle of a pandemic, but you know, we have to keep engagement in the word community engagement. So that's how I've been engaging with people. And what I do is, um, if there's and if the person, if that organization, um may not be interested, you know, I connect them to a, a partner. I, I, I identify what their need is and still con- find a way to connect them so that I can still remain relevant and fresh in their mind. Yeah, and, and that is key. That is key. Definitely building on those relationships and, and just keeping them strong and keeping just being engaged with those relationships. So that is awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so you are, so you're also a Black Ladies in Public Health New Jersey ambassador. Um, I, I know we we did a little clubhouse vibes with the black ladies in public health, which I enjoyed. I, I'm always glad when they um, let me into their space and just let me talk and whatnot. So I love that space. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I just love it. Yeah, me too. Me too. So everyone, if you have not, definitely tap into Black Leaders in Public Health. I think they're on Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, ev- everywhere. So so definitely tap into that. So what is Black Ladies in Public Health first of all? So Black Ladies in Public Health um, is a network of Black professionals, Black women professionals in the field, whether they work in government, tech, and every everything in between academia. And um, Black Ladies in Public Health was founded by Dr. Jasmine Ward. You can follow Black Ladies in Public Health at BLIPH16 on Twitter and Instagram. You can also search for them on Clubhouse in the, tool, in the search bar. But as far as... Um, being a New Jersey ambassador, I didn't come out becoming a um, New Jersey ambassador. What happened is I never knew about Black ladies in public health. And um, a couple years ago, myself and another colleague of mine, um, we were just talking and she said, you know, we need to connect with Black ladies. We need to connect with, you know, Black girls in public health in New Jersey. And then so we started to do um, monthly link ups and then um, we would invite a few people. So it went from like five to 10 to 20 and it was growing, you know, so many people in New Jersey identified as um, someone in public health and whether it's students, graduate student, undergrad, graduate students and young professionals. And then as we were growing, we learned about black ladies in public health. And someone was like, hey, have you learned of black ladies in public health? And we said, no, tell us more. And then we learned about this, this network 
So Jasmine's network, um, it was it was not just a network, but Jasmine had resources. Jasmine had um, Jasmine has resources, you know, connections with schools, programs, and all. So I'm not a person that believes in recreating the wheel. So we said, hey, let's schedule a meeting with Jazz and learn how we can move black girls in public health to black ladies in public health because we heard about the ambassador program we had a meeting with jasmine um we expressed our interest we did we fought we um we submitted an application to be ambassadors and then a month later we were invited to an ambassadors meeting with all the ambassadors throughout the country and um every every second monday of the month we we were on a call where we talk about what we're doing we talk about resources we talk about um, consulting opportunities. We talk about what's taking place in the country. We talk about different areas um, in public health that that that's being uplifted. We we talk about organizations. We talk about um, what we should share with the um, with our um, geographic region. So we went from Black girls in public health to Black ladies in public health, further expanding the um, the access. Okay. So we wanted to make sure that the women that we were engaging in New Jersey knew that they were supported by a bigger organization. So we became um, Black girl, Black Ladies in Public Health New Jersey, and we um, and whatever information that we received in our um, ambassadors call or clubhouse rooms or whenever we um, touch base with Jasmine, we share with the Black ladies. But then within the Black Black Ladies in Public Health New Jersey. We are sharing upcoming um, information on COVID-19 in New Jersey, initiatives that affect Black women, um, such as maternal child health. So in the state of New Jersey, there's an initiative called Nurture New Jersey, and we are sharing jobs, we're sharing resources. And we also do a lot more engagement where we are um, helping women shoot their shots, right? You know, people call it networking, but no, let's help a sister shoot her shot, you know, hey, you, you want to go into that program? You want to go into that role? Okay, cool. Well, this person has that person email. Let's do a soft handoff. Let's introduce let's introduce you to somebody, but let's tell you, let's show you how to go about it. How do you, how do you email somebody as a professional? How do you follow through? How you do, these are different skills and knowledge that we we share to people, and they're like, wow, I didn't know all of that, and it helped them get um, not just get to where they needed to go, but boost their confidence to shoot their shot. Because that's what it is when it comes to shooting shot, putting aside the imposter syndrome and stepping into your purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you have such amazing women around supporting you, it definitely oh, makes absolutely. it a lot, a lot easier. And shout out to Jasmine. She, she, yeah. she, she I is Jasmine. like, I'm, I'm amazed by Jasmine. Hopefully I can get her on the podcast sometime soon. Something. Whenever I'm on Clubhouse and I just come in, I was like, oh, you know, I'm just going to peek into the room and just like, let me just sit in the audience. Like, and like, mind you, Sometimes I'm under the sheets, like, you know, just listening to, I'm on club out just listening, and then I hear the bing. You're, you're now a moderator. I'm like, Jasmine, <laughs> this is my opinion, but it's just like everything that I'm doing to other people, she's doing to me, you know, pull, mm -hmm. hey, you know, nope. You know, hey guys, I want to introduce you to Marlene. And it's just like, okay, let me sit up real quick. <laughs> and let me talk. And it's just like, and after all that, I always gotta I always think to myself, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for doing that because that was necessary. And or thank you for connecting me to this person. Thank you for allowing, you know, and she creates that space and she's like, uh-uh, no, 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 no. I need I need you to talk and share what you know. Mm -hmm. So that there's because there's somebody in here that needs to hear what you're saying. And then and it's just um it's just wonderful to be within this network. So every time I come across a woman of color, the first thing I say is, "Have you heard of Black Ladies in Public Health?" No, you haven't. Let me add you to let me add you to the to to the um clubhouse. Let me let me share this with you. Let me share that with you. Please make sure you're following this person and that person. And it's just like wow, creating a culture of putting people on. Period. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I feel the same about Jasmine. Like I, I popped into a club room like an hour late and she pulled me up on stage to, to yep, talk. And, and, and it's just like it's like she's she knows immediately. It's just like, okay, I'm gonna stay here for five minutes. It's like five, four, three, three. And like, oh, wow. <laughs> you get called out. Yeah, she goes, uh, you know I was gonna call you out. I was gonna be quiet in the audience, Marlene, um, Munchie, like <laughs> but I love it. 
and we need we need that energy you know we need to call pull each other up and that's why when we were in clubhouse I was like, oh, Amara, you forgot something. Make sure you mention this. Make sure you forget. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. So thank you for that. And yeah, that, okay. I, that, I definitely look forward to uh, connecting with Jasmine some more and getting her on the podcast sometime soon. Not the Jasmine Ward for who for anyone who missed that. Yeah, she is. She is amazing. Truly amazing. Um, so if someone wants to become an ambassador for Black Leaders in Public Health, is it just that they have to submit uh, the application? Yes, they can do it online. Um, BLIPH.org, I believe, um, the website that, that might be the website, but don't, don't quote me on it. Just go find them on, find them on Instagram and go back. And then you may, and you may discover that they're already an ambassador in your area and you may want to just tap in and say, Hey, can I connect with you? Um, you know, I, I, I recognize that certain, certain regions have more than one ambassador and that's okay. You know, um, but you know, on our calls, they're working together. They're connecting. They're sharing. They're letting you know. They're um, they're letting each other know what's taking place in their region, and that's important because you know we want to make sure that there's that presence throughout. There's that national presence. You know, we're we're always talking about hey, what's the upcoming um conference that's taking place? You know, and it's just like okay, well, we want to make sure that everyone knows about this conference and and why or. We want people to know about this policy and why. Hey, make sure you're reading up on this. So there's this level of transparency and accountability that that we have for one another. And this and there's that sense of holding one another up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So definitely tap into that if you have not as yet anyone. Um, and then so you also you also the Society for Public Health Education, SOMI Ambassador. Uh, so what is a SOMI ambassador exactly? A SOMI ambassador, um, social media. So so is for social, M is for media. Um, again, coming back around with the skills, right? So um, I had received a scholarship from the New Jersey chapter um, one year to attend their um, advocacy summit that October. That I, um, I believe that was 2019. And when I attended the conference, you know, um, part, you know, I would tweet and or post about the conference in advance, and um, and when I got to the conference, I was tweeting more. And, and after that, I presented what I, my find as part of the scholarship, I had to present my findings from the Scott, from the, um, from the conference, the summit at the annual meeting. So that kind of like, you know, for me, I'm just like, okay, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just plugging, I'm sharing what, what I'm, what I'm learning, what I'm not, what I'm, what I'm learning or what the organization is about. And then that following year, it, it's just like, Hey, you know, I received an email saying, hey, we would like for you to be a social media ambassador for our upcoming um, co annual conference. And it was like, oh, wow, great. This is a great externship and a great way to um, connect with other public health professionals, but also, again, being intentional, um, you know, with my vision, um, connecting with other public health professionals, being exposed to other regions, um, what they're doing, um, and aligning um, their their different sessions with um, aligning their different sessions with what I knew. So what I did was that whatever sessions I was assigned to, I would do additional research and I would schedule the tweets on Twitter. I would use the hashtags. They would share a, um, a social media kit with me. So I didn't just follow the social media kit that they shared. I did a little bit more so that I would be prepared to engage um, people in the, in the, um, sessions but what I also wanted to do is that because I knew there was a strong following of women of color I wanted to make sure that I always incorporated um issues or tweets that that would draw draw them in right if it was a if it was a conversation on racial justice I made sure that I talked about you know the microaggressions or you know experiences of black women in the workplace um or um implicit biases right for example so I always made sure I circled back to the black diaspora yeah. And I, I think another key in what you said there is that like you were just posting on social media about your experience going to this conference and what you learned. And then from that, I guess they realize, oh, this person's very active on social media. Let's get them plugged into to this kind of work. So that, that is uh, just another key for people out there. So be active and, and you never know like what opportunities or who's looking at you, you know? Absolutely. It, I, it increased my um, engagement, my following on um, Instagram, Twitter, but you know, um, 
it also allowed me to see like, wow, like, okay, people are paying attention just as you, just as you said. And, um, when they, you know, after the conference, the people that I would, um, connect with, they would then share certain things with me because they knew what my, what my area of expertise was. Mm -hmm. So then they knew what my interests were. So then they would share things, they would share information with me. And then I would go back and share them with black ladies in public health, or I share them Mm -hmm. in my Instagram stories so that people can know more about it. So, um, it, my, I designed my, I, I developed and designed my, um, Instagram story to highlight those things. And there were times where, you know, I would take the time to, uh, create a content here or there, or I would connect with, with other public health professionals who had the content and the information. So I made sure that every time I posted their content, I would tag them, you know the deal. <laughs> I would tag them. And because it, it was more than just tagging them, but it was making sure that people who are following me would see that I'm connected with other black, indigenous, and people of color. So um I made I made it my business to find them on on pub on social media. So um people say, oh my God, I didn't know public health had so many different layers to it. And I'm like, yeah, there we are here. We are here. We want people to understand that our issues are real. Um, this is where, you know, this is the content people are developing. This is where they're finding it and that they're sharing with one another. And every time I would share it, I would notice that other people would reshare it and or post it within on their platforms. Yeah. And, and to that point, it's like building a, a, a personal brand. Like if if you don't share anything, no one's going to know like what interests you have, what what your expertise are and, and those kinds of things. So it just goes back to like... <laughs> getting whatever information and sharing it and then you never know what's going to come your way from from doing that kind of thing and just and as as I always say like you have a personal brand even if you don't share anything so like why don't you be active in creating and be active and proactive in creating what personal brand you want and what opportunities may come your way through that Um, never know Exactly. Um, so you also the New, New Jersey Society for Public Health Education chapter delegate. So what's this about? So as a chapter delegate, I'm basically the liaison between the national organization and the state organization. It's a position where um, I sit on the House of Delegates. Um, I'm required to join two committees, which I haven't decided on yet. My term hasn't begun. Um, it, I will be in um, in March, and the great thing about it is that I'm I I get to know what's taking place on a national level, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what programs are getting ready to be um, to um, to develop, right? What was was the planning? Was the budget for this? You know, just you know, just typical um, executive board business. But for me, I took on this position because I, I understood the importance of representation, right? Mm-hmm. More um, women of color in these spaces. And for me, I wanted that bird eyes view, right? That bird eyes view where from the national point of view, I can identify what sources and resources that they have and being able to be a part of the decision making, right? So that to open doors for other um, public health professionals. For, for, for example, whether, whether it comes um, to, to scholarships, how can we get more black and brown students to apply for these scholarships and if how can we get more black and brown students to be um to be aware of these scholarships right because um i i remember being that student wanting to sink my teeth into public health but i didn't know where to go so it it, you know now in this position like wow okay i was that person and i knew the um the challenges that i had and the barriers that i faced so let me use that and um identify, you know, express those things so that we can make them equitable, so that we can make them, um, we can make, you know, scholarships, awards equitable, um, and or, um, well, being the, being in this role is more than just um, being a face, is representation and making sure that things that are taking place are inclusive to black and brown students and or other, um, underrepresented un- underrepresented populations or groups okay so 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 you all saw that more people were seeing like the scholarship uh requirements and saying oh i'm not qualified for this and you're, you're trying to make it more inclusive for 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 minority uh people people of color yeah because that's that's you know how i felt in the past you know so um and that's the great thing about 
networking with other um, people of color on the social spaces because you come to find out that we all have the similar stories and you're like, wait, hold up, you know, okay. So if it's more than one person with this, with this story, imagine other students who are, you know, currently in school with this, with this feeling, right? But they don't know how to express it because I didn't know how to express it as a student, right? So by developing um, opportunities that are more inclusive for black and brown students, then we'll see an increased um, engagement with them in the field. Yeah, abs absolutely, absolutely. So you've we've spoken about a lot of roles that you did in your current job and then, well, in, like in your role in your professional job and then as well as like outside of that on the side. So talk to me about the importance of being active, not only in your job, but outside of your job. It's important, flat out, period. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's important. Because it's just like, um, it's, you won't, you won't go far just by staying in the same place. It, it's kind of like when someone says, oh my God, I want to date, but I'm going to stay in the house. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> you won't, you won't do it. You won't get where you're, where, where you won't get where you want to go by staying still. So it's very important to be active, um, you know, and it's not just on social media, get active in the community, get active in your um, in your program. Um, you know, take take roles in your student organization, and that's where I, you know that's where I started when I was um, in college at Montclair. I I took you know student student I took roles on student organizations, um, and I participated. I engaged. I did a lot of volunteering. I bear I you know there are times where all I would talk about was community service. Mm -hmm. And um, over time, community service, my perspective on what community service was changed, you know? Okay. Yeah, and definitely fits in where you, where you fit in, where you fit in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Th thanks for sharing that. Uh, so you, you recently got accepted into your PhD program at Howard in culture, communication, and media studies. Big congratulations. Thank um, you. What, what, what's the thought process? Give me the thought process for, for going into this PhD specifically. My friend introduced me to this program. It goes back to the circle that you're in, right? Your network. Mm -hmm. when, when your network understands what you're passionate about, they will bring things, they will plug you in, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, my partner at um, Black Ladies in Public Health, she's the, uh, my partner, Iman, she's the other ambassador for the New Jersey region. And she one day says this, I'm, I'm on Facebook and I was, I'm not supposed to, but check this program out. It's, it, I think it will speak to you. And at that very moment, it did. Um, the program spoke about social injustice. It spoke about culture. It spoke about race. It spoke about public health and it sp spoke about communication. How are we communicating health within the Black diaspora to prevent diseases, right? And keeping them engaged, right? And so with that thought process, I made sure that um, everything that I was doing leading up to applying aligned with the program. Um, I didn't just give them the requirements that they asked for. I, I shared a small portfolio. I shared a, um, I also shared a PowerPoint presentation of, um, one of my presentations at the um, summit that I that I um, did for um, public health um, co public health consulting research, right? Mm -hmm. So with um, Leonor Aquari, mm -hmm. and I made sure I incorporated all that. I was very intentional. Um, one of the biggest um, challenges was asking for help, right? I, just because I talk about plugging, you know, other people in, I too have experienced, you know, imposter syndrome at. At, at, at some times where it's just like, okay, you know, I, I know I have these people, but asking, asking for help is hard, right? Mm -hmm. But as I was getting ready to ask for a recommendation that it was just like, Marlene, yes. I'm like, yes, what? You don't know. And it's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, that was the type of response that I was getting from, from my network that, um, that, that wrote me, you know, the individuals who wrote me letter of re letters of recommendation to Howard. So I, I was very intentional. I made sure that um, that the um, the essays and or the autobiographical sketch that I sent aligned with the program. And I talked about, I spoke more on um, my community engagement 
I spoke more about the injustice in the community. I spoke about um, the injustice that my family experienced as Haitians coming to America in the 80s in the height of the HIV pandemic, right? You know, during that time, they spent 10 years experiencing xenophobia because the FDA had declared that Haitians had bad blood, right? So that sense of advocacy that I talked about, I talked about how my mother participated in the, um, in the protests in, in, the, in the 90s, right? Across the Brooklyn Bridge. I talked about these things and I, and I made sure I closed, uh, I closed off sharing the importance of health communication in the diaspora. So I, I was very intentional about um, that. That was my word for 2020, by the way. That's why I keep bringing it up. I want somebody to take that word and run with it, right? Um, I made sure that um, the people, the work that I was doing was preparing me for the next step. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and I feel like everything you just spoke about is so needed. And in the last months, we were just, and going forward, we just see how important it is for, for these types of roles and like, but just people getting the health education that they need and getting it in relevant and, and adequate ways and just like battling this, this mistrust and, and all the medical versus community and the research versus community and all those different challenges that we have faced. So it will be, it's, it's so essential just going forward for, for like whenever we have the next pandemic or whatever the case might be. And even outside of that, just generally speaking for all these health conditions and, and everything, everything under the sun. So uh, thank you for doing this. And I look forward to, to seeing your journey throughout your PhD program. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. So where would you like to see yourself in the future? Dr. Marlene Dumsa Edmund <laughs> Chester. <laughs> I'm so serious. <laughs> I see myself um, as that. And also um, expanding my public health entrepreneurship. I, I don't just see myself... Um, just working in the field of public health, but um, training public health professionals. I see myself teaching in academia for, um, and I wouldn't say that's long-term, but I, I'm realizing that you can do all of this together, right? Mm -hmm. I see myself continuing to bring up and uplift other black ladies in the field and um, working with a group of black women who are kicking but <laughs> in this field you know i i see myself doing that and and now that, that's that was another um aha moment for me to apply to how to apply to howard it was just like i i need to i need to do this there, there's something there's something that's missing i need to do this <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you found your thing and I know that you're going to kill it in Howard. So best of luck. Yeah. You're most welcome. Uh, so moving along to the Furious Five, the last, well, the last section of the show, the only section of the show that I call a section of the show. Um, the five questions I ask all guests. Um, number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Oh, I'm going to circle back to my, to my first advice. Networking gets you through more doors than your degree. I like it short and sweet. Number two, right? <laughs> if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Circle them back. Be intentional with your vision. <laughs> Make sure it's clear. Make sure it's clear. Absolutely. Number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Child imposter syndrome. This, this Listen, I'm kicking it out. Mm -hmm. Just listen we're, we're not doing this we're walking into our we're walking in our walking into our purpose and walking in our purpose absolutely so, imposter syndrome got to go <laughs> i love it uh number four professionally do you recommend anything oh i recommend a lot i hope i hope okay so at this point i hope someone grab grab your notebook grab a pen because you will be writing okay mm -hmm. so i have a number of recommendations i have let's start off with the organizations that we talked about Black Ladies in Public Health, founded by Dr. Jasmine Ward. And I will name drop because I need you to look up these people in these things. Um, the Society for Public Health Education, SOFI. Um, once you are on SOFI, identify the different chapter in your the chapters in your area um, and connect with them. Um, as far as podcasts, I would say Dr. Charlotte Huntley, the Public Health Epidemiology Career Podcast. Definitely check Dr. Um, Huntley out. 
Dr. Hunley also has an upcoming public health consulting and entrepreneurship expo. The expo is going live February 16th. I lastly, as no, I'm lying. I'm so lying. The uh, <laughs> the last two podcasts I would recommend, um, Leonor Aquari, love her to death. She um, has a podcast called the Public Health Culture Podcast. You can find these podcasts on um, Apple and, and or you can find them on Instagram and identify where, where you can um, locate them. Um, one that I've been exploring as well, um, NPR Code Switch. They talk mm -hmm. a lot about racial inequities. Definitely a podcast to tune in. I have so many different podcasts, but I, those are the top four that, um, the top three that I wanted to share. Um, lastly, as far as books, I know medical apartheid has been um, talked about before, but I'm going to say it again. Mm -hmm. um, but also some other books that I'd like to um, share. Um, Hood Feminism. I've read that probably, I'm going on three times reading this book. Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. Um, Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper. Love that book. Um, Upstream by Dan Heath. I would also recommend Principles by Ray Dalio. Yeah, okay, okay. Didn't expect to hear Ray Dalio on the list, but those are some oh. <laughs> some great, great, great resources right there that you shared. I, I have that on my list. I just have a bunch of other books that I've bought that I'm trying to read. I won't, I won't tell you other books on your nightstand that you just said that. <laughs> yeah, no. Also, um, another one, it's a short read, Emotional Intelligence. I'm currently reading this. Don't worry, I read, I chain read just like you do, Omari. So those are the two I keep on my desk so that I can um, catch up on. But a lot of these books, um, don't just, um, my recommendation is not just to highlight. I actually add them in my notes on my MacBook. Mm -hmm. And um, for every chapter I, I write, you know, I type in the different takeaways or different things that stand out and mark the um, the page. Or if I'm listening to a podcast, I do a time or a YouTube video, I put timestamps and I refer back to them. So again, being intentional because you never know who's going to need information, but also you can circle back and add them to your papers. Okay. Hmm. Key tip. Look, look at that key tip you're getting right there. But yeah, I've, I've been trying to do that too. Um, definitely like outlining my notes from books and, and putting it somewhere else where I can go back and, okay. and we look at it. I, yeah. I know Leonor Aquari had mentioned on LinkedIn the other day. I'm not sure if you noticed. She said that she's making it her business to read medical apartheid every year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for people to do that. If you mm -hmm. haven't read medical apartheid, look it up. But she, her saying that definitely sparked the light and said, you know what? I, I should consider doing that as well. Mm, that, that is good that is good because it definitely keeps your your mindset and keeps your eye on the prize you know yep, yeah so much. yes absolutely okay so last but not least where can people connect with you you can connect on uh, you can connect with me on linkedin um uh, marlene d edmund you can connect me on all of my social media platforms twitter clubhouse instagram um at munchy the plug m-u-n-c-h-y-d-a plug p-l-u-g munchy the plug awesome well thank you so much munchy the plug for plugging me in and and coming and taking time to be on the podcast uh and i'm i'm just really i'm really glad yeah it, it was fun and she was nervous before guys just just in case you all wonder <laughs> <laughs> nah, but it's all good. It's all, all love, all love across here. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing thank your story. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. Well, I hope that you all enjoyed this episode. I know I definitely did uh, listening to, well, connecting with Marlene, the plug, Munchie, the plug. Um, I know there's a lot of invaluable information in this episode, especially like that self-care part, the networking part to, to really get yourself ahead in your career, as well as the doing community-based work when you might even know it's like public health work and how that could really help and shape your public health experience. So definitely if you took some value from this, go connect with Munchy the Plug, um, reach out to her, reach out to me if you have any questions. Be sure to subscribe, review, share this with a friend. I appreciate you all. Leave a like. Um, but tune in next week for our next episode. Hope everyone is doing well. Take care, be safe, love and peace.